as folks adapt to this changing world, we are all going to be buying more stuff online than ever before. If you're an e-commerce seller, are you ready to meet the demands of our new delivery culture? Be ready with ShipStation. ShipStation is the fastest, easiest, and most affordable way to manage and ship your orders. Just a few clicks and you'll be managing orders, printing out labels, and getting your product to happy customers. ShipStation makes it easy. I recently began selling signed copies of my book, Don't Waste Your Pretty. I'm new to being an e-commerce seller, but ShipStation has been helping me manage all of those orders, get those labels printed, and get my packages out to my customers in a timely and convenient fashion. ShipStation helps online sellers of any size get orders out quickly, save money on shipping costs, and keep customers happy. And right now, Ratchet and Respectable listeners can try ShipStation free for 60 days when you use offer code RESPECT. Make sure your business is ready to meet the demands of delivery culture. Get started at ShipStation.com today. Click on the microphone at the top of the homepage and type in RESPECT. That's ShipStation.com. Then enter offer code RESPECT. ShipStation.com. Make ship happen. Is there something interfering with your happiness? Anything keeping you from achieving your goals? I know what that feeling is. I've had my own bouts with unhappiness and depression. And if you are experiencing it, know that you don't have to go through it alone. If you are looking for help, BetterHelp is here to, well, help. BetterHelp's mission is to make professional counseling accessible, affordable, and convenient. So anyone who struggles with life's challenges can get help anytime, anywhere. BetterHelp will assess your needs and match you with your own licensed professional therapist. So many people have been using BetterHelp that they are recruiting additional counselors in all 50 states. If your life is not what you want it to be, if you are in conflict and chaos, it is time to get help. I want you to start living a happier life today. As a listener, you'll get 10% off your first month by visiting betterhelp.com slash ratchet. Join over 1 million people taking charge of their mental health. Again, that's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash ratchet. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, you're listening to Ratchet and Respectable with Demetria L. Lucas. I'm, I'm not in a good mood, and I'm trying to push through it. If you've been following the news, you know about the case of Jacob Blake in Wisconsin. Another black man, 29 years old, shot seven times in the back by police officers with his three children in the car. He survived that shooting, miraculously. The last news report that I read said that he was paralyzed, which, if you survive being shot seven times in your back, being paralyzed is kind of the obvious thing that happens, my God. And there's been a lot of fallout, which I'm going to talk about, but I'm going to talk about it later in the episode and not for a lack of care, but because there are other good things going on in the world and going on in my life that I would like to talk about first. I was thinking about the late and beloved Toni Morrison, and I was thinking about her quote about the function of racism. Quote, the function, the very serious function of racism is distraction. It keeps you from doing your work. It keeps you explaining over and over again your reason for being. Somebody says you have no language and you spend 20 years proving that you do. So while I'm very upset about Jacob Blake and while it is a very important story, I am not going to be distracted from doing the episode that I intended to bring to you. And also sharing a bit of my joy with you. It's been a really big week for me. Last Thursday, TV One announced that they had adapted my second book, Don't Waste Your Pretty, into a rom-com, a TV film that is going to air on the network in 2021. I've been sitting on this news for almost two years since I first signed the contract. The script was written in 2019, and they told me just after the new year that we were going into production in the spring. 
that obviously got pushed back because of COVID-19. But remember a couple weeks ago when I was in Atlanta and I told you I was working on a really big project and I couldn't tell you what it was? I was working on my TV film. I'm super, super excited about this project. When I wrote Don't Waste Your Pretty in 2014, it was a collection of Ask Demetria questions. I think at the time I'd answered something like 38,000 anonymous questions online. By the time I ended Ask Dimitri, I'd answered something like 60 or 70,000. I kept getting the same questions over and over and over again. And so I was like, you know what? I'm going to make a book so y'all can have reference material. So y'all can not ask me the same questions over and over and over again. And we can move on to new questions. I wrote that book at my kitchen table in Brooklyn. I self-published it. My first book, A Bell in Brooklyn, was on Simon & Schuster, and contractually, they had first dibs on my second book. If you know anything about the book publishing process, it's a very long process. So right now, we're August 2020. If the book I'm working on right now were to be sold tomorrow, it wouldn't be out until 2022. There's a very, very long lead time for books. So I asked them if they would let me out of my contract. I was on a TV show at the time, and I was like, you're going to have me on the show as a businesswoman, as a writer, and I don't have no business. I don't have no book to sell. I don't have, any, I don't have anything. I convinced my editor to let me out of my contract, and I self-published my book, which was a real risk at the time. It was still like a big deal to have an affiliation with one of like the big five publishing houses. Self-publishing was frowned upon. No matter the quality of your book, it was looked at as lesser. But now, you know, everyone has their own thing. People go independent all the time. People on major labels intentionally go independent. You have more control over your product. You can put it out when you want to. You have to make more of an initial investment. But on the back end, if you do well, you can be significantly rewarded. So that was a huge gamble for me in 2014. And I didn't think about anything other than getting the book out as soon as possible. My last book had come out in 2011. I felt like there was a three-year gap. I should be dropping books every year. Crazy talk. But that's what I thought at the time. And so I was like, well, I have to have something or else I'll be irrelevant. So I wrote Don't Waste Your Pretty. And that book has been the gift that keeps on giving. People have asked like, oh my God, you have a film. Is this a dream come true? And I can't even say that because it wasn't even something that I dreamt of. I I thought I was going to put that book out and it was going to do the sales that it did for 2014 into 2015. And that would be the end of it. We'd be on to the next. It would just be a pretty book on my bookshelf. It's really, I don't know the right word. It's not ironic. It's not weird. It's really unexpected the way this whole thing came to be. In 2011, when I wrote A Bell in Brooklyn, I'd come out to L.A. for a week or so to do a series of network meetings because I was pitching A Bell in Brooklyn as a TV series. One of the execs that I met with, Karen Petterkin, we had a great conversation about A Bell in Brooklyn. She said, I think it's really wonderful. And she was like, it's just not the content that we're looking for at this time. So, you know, I took it as a loss. You know, it was a no. We shopped the book to other places. Alicia Keys was on board as a producer. A Bell in Brooklyn has been bought and returned to me three separate times by two major networks. It just didn't pan out, which, you know, is the way of the world in in Hollywood. I'd kind of given up hope on, on turning A Bell in Brooklyn into anything. I'd never thought about turning Don't Waste Your Pretty into a series. Definitely not a movie. It's a hardcore dating and relationship advice book. It's a QA and a book, you know. I never thought anything would come of it. About two years ago, my manager got a call from Karen. Karen had gone over to TV One and she was like, hey, is A Bell in Brooklyn still available? Because we're working on this idea for a rom-com and I really loved A Bell in Brooklyn. And did Demetria ever do anything with it? Is it, you know, tied up with another studio or another network? I was honest with her. I was like, I don't think A Bell in Brooklyn is a rom-com and I don't think it's a TV film. But I was like, in terms of what you're saying you're looking for, I was like, you might want to consider Don't Waste Your Pretty if you really just want to adapt a dating and advice book into a rom-com. I felt like it worked for Steve Harvey for Act Like a Lady, Think Like a Man. That book was a hardcore advice book. It got turned into a film. So I sent over the PDF of the book and Karen came back in like under 30 days and was like, yeah, this could work. We want to move forward. We want to buy the rights to the book to turn it into a TV film. I've had, like I said, two different networks, three different times buy the rights to my book. They pay me a huge chunk of money to keep it for a year. 
and then they renew it after a year. And then after that second year, they always send it back and, and basically say they don't know what to do with it. They'll hire writers, we'll go through beat sheets, we'll go through scripts, we'll do all of that stuff. And then they come back and say, well, no, we decided not to move forward. For this, I thought it would probably be another situation where you're going to buy it, you're going to keep the rights, and I'll take your money. I honestly didn't expect them to move forward. I'd been through this ringer so many times before. They bought the book and then they hired the writer. And I met with the writer, Katrina Ogilvie, came out to LA and I met with her twice. And I was all prepared to like explain the book and talk about characters and everything else. And she just wanted to talk. We went to get drinks the first time. And then the second time she was working on the ABC lot, the Disney lot. I went over to the lot on her lunch break and we just sort of hung out and just talked about life. More than anything, like she picked apart all these different pieces of my personality and my life and stuff from the book and stuff from my Instagram. And she just crafted this like amazing story, something that I never would have come up with, but something that was good and sexy. And she understood my ideas of romance and my ideas of how I wanted to portray black love. Katrina really captured that in the writing of this script. Maybe like two months ago, we did a table read with all of the actors. And mind you, I've read this script 50 times minimum. It's gone through a million reiterations, which is standard, mostly to dialogue, not so much to story. But I know this script in and out. I can recite big chunks of it. I know the story, obviously. But during the table read, and all the actors were on, and this film is starring Carrie Hilson and Deborah Joy Winans, aka Charity from Greenleaf. But they were reading like the emotional scenes and they were going back and forth with the love interest. I was just on the call like in awe, like my mouth is slack. I've got my elbow on the table and my head is resting in my hand. I was fully invested. Like I didn't know what was about to happen next, but it was really good. It was really, really good. I went down to Atlanta for a week. I have a very small cameo in the film, and I'm also an executive producer. So I went to, you know, see what was going on. I showed up trying to act like it wasn't a big deal, even though it totally was. I ain't never been on no film set before. I've been on a million sets, but it's usually morning TV, which is entirely different. I've done unscripted TV a couple times, which is entirely different. But a film set is just... It's just a different vibe. It's just a different energy. It was nothing like what I expected. I was excited. I'm still excited. Like it just, it feels very surreal. I'd given up hope really on A Bell in Brooklyn and I really had no plans for Don't Waste Your Pretty. As a thank you really to my audience, I decided to sell signed copies of Don't Waste Your Pretty. Everyone in my orbit in real life and social media was super excited about the film announcement and I wanted to do something special for my readers. For like all the years I had a blog, all the years I had social media, I've never sold anything on my website. I wanted to say like a thank you to my audience. I was like, hey, I found this box of signed copies. Let me know if you want one. I'll set it up on the site and you guys can buy them. I sold more copies of Don't Waste Your Pretty on Tuesday than I did when the book was released six years ago. And I sold good numbers then, but like Tuesday floored me. So thank you, thank you, thank you a million times over for your support of me and of my work all of these years. Um, I can't wait for you to see the film. I can't wait till I see the film. It's already been filmed, production has wrapped. They're in post-production now. Um, In screenwriting school, they tell you that a film is made three times, once when it's written, once when it's shot, and once when it's edited. I definitely know the first two are good. I want to see the third. I have very high hopes. I hope that it meets all of my expectations. I'm still waiting on TV One to give me a date so we can start planning. I imagine we'll still be in a pandemic, so I might not be able to host large watch parties. But I do hope that you and your girlfriends, and I want you guys to watch this in group settings, and I want you to swoon and giggle and laugh and drink wine and be super invested in this what I think is a really great story about black love and about second chances. I will give this one tidbit away. Two of the main characters are sort of split versions of my personality. One of them is a divorcee who is afraid to date again after her disastrous marriage and she stopped believing in love. I feel like that's a story for a lot of women who have been through divorce or who've been in long-term relationships that ended. It's like you put your all 
out there for someone and it didn't work out. And either you're afraid to believe in love or you're scared of being hurt that way or you're scared of being vulnerable, which I totally get. I've totally had that feeling. That's something that I had to do a lot of work to work through. But I do believe in second chances. So that's it. That's what I wanted to tell you about Don't Waste Your Pretty, the film. Super excited. So, yeah. I don't know about you, but sometimes I feel like I need a summer vacation from cooking. When the heat rises, I'm looking for ways to do less. That's why lately I've been skipping out on meal prep and keeping things easy with Daily Harvest. Right now, Daily Harvest is helping me beat the heat with their refreshing smoothies and delicious scoops their new plant-based ice cream. Scoops are free of additives, preservatives, and fillers because they're made with whole nourishing organic ingredients like black sesame, coconut cream, and dragon fruit. And they have four amazing flavors. I am obsessed with these scoops. They're so delicious. My favorite is the vanilla and salted swirl black sesame, or they added a chocolate and ooey gooey midnight fudge. Eating clean food with Daily Harvest is easy and effortless, whether you're having a night at home or need a quick bite on the go. Keep it simple this summer with Daily Harvest. Go to dailyharvest.com and enter promo code RESPECTABLE to get $25 off your first box. That's promo code RESPECTABLE for $25 off your first box at dailyharvest.com. dailyharvest.com. So we have to talk about Jacob Blake. I don't really want to, but we need to. You've been watching the news, I'm sure. This story is everywhere. It's it's unavoidable at this point. In Kenosha, Kenosha, I'm not really sure how to pronounce it. I've been reading the news instead of watching it. I'm trying to avoid seeing the video of Blake being shot seven times. I've watched enough videos of black men being shot. I said after Ahmaud Arbery, I was done. I've avoided the George Floyd video. I still haven't seen it. But I'm actively avoiding watching this video because I feel like just a little piece of my spirit dies every time I see one of those videos and every time I re-see it. And I don't want to do that to myself. So this is my form of self-care. But also, because I haven't heard the name of this city pronounced, I don't know how to pronounce it. So the city in Wisconsin that I can't pronounce. The video that's circulating shows police officers following close behind Blake with their guns drawn. When Blake opens the door to his car and attempts to step inside, the officers suddenly fire repeatedly toward his back at least seven times. Notably, Blake's three young children were also in the car, so they witnessed their father being shot. With God's grace, Blake is not dead. He was taken to the hospital in serious condition for obvious reasons. I read earlier today that he is paralyzed. Shortly after the shooting, The city in Wisconsin that I can't pronounce pretty much went up in flames. People started rioting, which, you know, is expected. The city declared an emergency curfew, which is expected. We saw this happen with George Floyd. You know, I kind of know the protocol of everything now. There are protests around the country, again, because we're fresh off George Floyd, but also Ahmaud Arbery and Breonna Taylor and Elijah McCain and Countless other people who have been hurt or murdered by the police and for whatever reason, their stories didn't become national and their names didn't become hashtags, but their lives matter all the same. I did read that the officers involved have been placed on leave, which that's the bare minimum. If I shot somebody in the back seven times, I would be arrested within the hour. But these police officers, they get to do it and they get to be placed on leave while people deliberate what should be done instead of just doing the correct moral and ethical thing to do. I read that the police were called because two white women were fighting in the street and Blake was trying to break up the fight. I'm trying to understand how you get a call about white women fighting in the street and then you show up and shoot the black guy on the scene seven times in the back. Like, like, how does that happen? The reaction to this has been swift. The city in Wisconsin, I can't pronounce, as I mentioned, is on fire. There are protests all over the country. It's not as many protests as George Floyd, and, and that was international. But there are protests nonetheless, and some notable kinds of protesting. LeBron James is on Twitter cussing. 
which he speaks up about issues a lot, which I really appreciate about him. But I've never heard this from him before. He said, quote, fuck this, man. We demand change. Sick of it. Exclamation point. Doc Rivers, who was the coach of the Clippers, I believe. I don't follow basketball like that. So stay with me. But Doc Rivers, I'm going to have to play it for you because I'm not going to do it justice just to read it. Just, just watching the Republican revenge, uh, convention, and this, they're spewing this fear, right? Like, all you hear Donald Trump and all of them talking about fear. We're the ones getting killed. We're the ones getting shot. Uh, we're the ones that we're denied to live in certain communities. Um, we've been hung and. All you do is keep hearing about fear. It's it's amazing to me why we keep loving this country and this country does not love us back. And it's just it's really so sad. Like I should just be a coach. And it's so often reminded of my color you know it's just really sad we gotta do better yeah his voice cracked and my eyes welled up with tears because you can hear his pain i think he said what a lot of people are thinking the milwaukee bucks they decided to boycott their game against the orlando magic tonight in protest they showed up to the site And they were in the locker room. The game was supposed to start at three and they just ain't come out. ESPN reported that they were in the locker room and they were on the phone with the Wisconsin attorney general and the lieutenant governor. Point guard George Hill from the Bucks, he gave a very succinct statement to the undefeated about the boycott. He said, quote, we're tired of the killings and the injustice. End quote. That's it. The NBA canceled the other games as well. I think that's actually backwards. I think players from other teams decided not to play, and then the NBA was like, oh, everything's canceled. But I was like, no, I think they boycotted your shit, and then you decided to call it canceled. I was like, you can't really cancel what's not happening, but, you know, go with whatever makes you feel good. But I really respect the Bucks. They're down in Florida in the Disney bubble to keep them safe from COVID, but home is Wisconsin, and they're not there to help or march or protest and be in the streets with the people, none of that. So they did what they could from a distance. So I respect that. The Brewers and the Reds, this is baseball, they decided not to play either in protest. MLB.com reported that prior to the game, there was a message on the video board at Miller Park that read, Justice Equality Now, all caps. The WNBA, they're not playing as well. They decided to sit this one out to stand in solidarity with the NBA. The sports world is really taking a stand. What's the young lady from um, the black girl? She's black and Asian. Come on. What's her name? Naomi Osaka. She said in a statement on Twitter that she will not play in her semifinal match at the Cincinnati Masters in response to the shootings of Blake and other black people in the U.S. by police. She said, quote, As a black woman, I feel as though there are much more important matters at hand that need immediate attention rather than watching me play tennis. Yeah, I respect her very much for that. But this is falling in line. A lot of sports figures have just said enough is enough. Like, I'm not going to go out here and throw a ball or hit a ball and entertain you while people who look like me aren't respected or are being gunned down or being slaughtered in the streets. I saw a clip from, um, there's a sports show on TNT. Forgive me, I'm not into sports like that. I, I just know ESPN Sports Center. But I guess TNT's version of Sports Center, Kenny Smith, he's a commentator on the show. He's a former NBA player. But he was on set, and I guess they asked him, you know, what are your thoughts about, you know, the Milwaukee Bucks or some of the other players who are not participating in sports? What do you think about all this? And he just had this. This energy, you could see it in his posture that all his fucks were gone. The factory was fresh out. And so I knew he was about to say something wild. He really didn't say anything wild. It's what he did. So he was trying to answer the question. And he basically said, you know what? I'm not equipped to explain what people are feeling right now. 
And I want to support the players. As a black man, as a former athlete, my solidarity is is with my people and with them. So on that note, I'm just not going to be here tonight. So sir undid his microphone and he put the pack on the table. He went and got the rest of the microphone. He fished it out from wherever in his clothes. He put it down on the table quite calmly and he got up and walked off set. And his white co-host, I don't know sports like that, so I don't know the name of the co-host, but it was a white dude. So he watched him walk off set and then he looked to the left confused. He Like, like what am I supposed to do now? Like my co-host just left. The black guy just walked off the set in and, and hurt and anger and disappointment. He's refusing to work today. Like what, what do I do? I don't know what he did. I just know that black man was gone. He said, bye-bye. I stand with the athletes. I genuinely thought about not doing this podcast. 90% of my audience is black. And I kind of feel like we just need some relief. So if I can provide a little joy and a little relief, we're going to talk about some shenanigans too, because Christians been acting up. Not saying all the Christians, but some Christians. We're going to talk about a couple leaders in the church who've been showing their whole ass. But before that, I want to talk about Meg the Stallion. She was shot, I guess like three weeks ago, a month ago at this point. It was assumed that Tory Lanez, Canadian rapper, it was assumed that he was the person that shot her, but Meg had never said who it was. After she was shot, she got on the internet and said, hey, I see all y'all clowning me about getting shot. And she was like, this is something serious. Like, I was shot. Like, I am a woman and someone shot me. I am not okay. I got shot. This is not funny. And I saw a bunch of jokes online, guys saying really crash shit. And it was like, oh, you wanted to have a hot girl summer? Well, this is what happens to hot girls. I'm like, really? Sometimes I think black men who say stuff like that. I was like, y'all don't understand how much y'all sound like racist white folks. Because white people would be like, oh, well, he didn't comply. And that's why he got shot. But that's basically the same thing you're saying to Megan. Like, oh, you want to be a hot girl? We have rules for you. You didn't comply. So you deserve to be shot. Many had speculated that Tory Lanez had shot Megan. But because she didn't specifically say he shot me, people kind of blamed her for her own shooting. It was weird. But Meg went live on Instagram and she said, no, I want to be clear. Like Tory Lane shot me like he shot me in my feet. This is a domestic violence incident. And let me tell you, the reason that I didn't say anything is because the police show up. We're a bunch of black people in California. We got a gun in the car, clearly, because I just got shot with it. And she was like, the police are there. And she was like, I'm not trying to get anybody else shot. She was like, I was scared. I don't want the police to shoot anyone else. I don't want anything to happen to the people that I was in the car with. So yeah, like I get shot and I don't say anything. I don't tell them there's a gun in the car. Like I'm trying to protect everyone. She was like, I get to the hospital and I did the same thing. And she was like, and he shot me. And I don't get on the internet and say, hey, this man shot me. But because I don't throw him under the bus... His publicist starts going around planting these crazy ass stories online, blaming me for my own shooting. And she was like, I didn't shoot myself. He shot me. That's crazy. And she was like, here, I'm out here trying to protect this black man, trying to protect these people in the car, not to make this situation worse. And then you have your publicist go and you blame me like for protecting you. Like I'm doing you a solid and you still throw me under the bus. She was hurt. And I felt that hurt. And part of me was like, girl, what are you doing trying to protect a man that shot you? You owe that man no loyalty? Even though people were out here calling her a snitch and was like, how mad going to tell on Tory Lanez? He shot her. They ain't in a gang together. They not out selling drugs together. They not out doing nefarious shit together. They were people out for a night partying. I guess they were in a relationship, so it's a domestic situation. But like, he shot her. You don't owe no loyalty to somebody who shoots you. You sound nuts. That's just some backwards hood shit. It's one thing if y'all doing dirt together and you get caught and they be like, well, who did at, who did whatever else? No, you got yourself involved in some dirt. Like that's some shit. When you sinning with folks, that's one thing. When you out here just trying to party and have a good night in the city, somebody fucking shoots you. You ain't no snitch for telling them who did that. But I think... I won't say every because it's always some exceptions to this weird rule. I think damn near every black woman has some story very similar to Megan. For some man 
unfortunately, it's usually a black man, does some crazy shit to you and you protect his name because black men have it hard. Black men have it so difficult. As black women, it's ingrained in us to protect black men. We put ourselves in harm's way, oftentimes trying to protect black men. We don't take care of ourselves to take care of someone else. And so as much as I look at Meg and be like, baby girl, what were you thinking? You should have been like him. You should have pointed a finger and been like him. He shot me. Him. That one right there. Him. I'd be lying if I said I hadn't protected some black man who didn't deserve protection. Done it a lot of times. Done it too many times. I remember at the height of Me Too, I was talking about being assaulted literally the week I moved to New York by someone that I'd met when I was in grad school. Someone that I worked with. I thought he was a friend. I thought he was somebody I could trust. Like he'd done right by me professionally. Like he really helped me get my career started. And we went out for drinks to celebrate my move to New York. I went to grad school at NYU and then I went home for seven months because I couldn't find a job. And then I moved back to New York. So I moved back on like a Sunday. I started work on Monday. I want to say I went out for Friday night with him because he was a really good friend and a mentor to celebrate. And we had a bunch of drinks. And I wrote about this in the second chapter of my first book, A Bell in Brooklyn. But I detailed like how like one of my mentors like assaulted me. I called a friend. I was up in Harlem and I called a friend. I told him what happened and he was like, stay there. I'm on my way. And when my friend showed up, he tried to essentially kill dude. He, he beat the shit out of him in the middle of the street. And he was reaching in, in the trunk of his car for a golf club to continue to beat his ass. And I stopped him. And he looked at me like I was crazy. And I was like, don't kill him. I just want to go. I just want to go. I just want to go. Part of my thinking was I didn't want the friend that I called. If a neighbor overheard the commotion, if they knew what was going on, I didn't want a neighbor to call the police. And then my friend who came to help me get in trouble. But then I also, for whatever reason, like, I just didn't want that guy to be arrested either. Like, I wanted him to get his ass beat, yes. But I didn't want the police to show up and kill him, potentially, because that's a possibility when you call the police on black men. And that's just, like, the first time I remember doing it. But there's been so many other instances. I remember this guy I was dating. He was drunk, and he was mad at me because I didn't want him to spend the night. So he was trying to come in my house. And I called one of his boys and was like, you need to come get your friend because your friend is drunk as shit in the street. Like, I'm really, and I specifically said, I'm not trying to call the police on him. So can you come get him? And his boy lived like a couple of blocks away. So he was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm on my way. I'm on my way. I'm on my way. When I got on the phone with his friend, he was like, yo, who the fuck are you talking to? And he ran up on me and snatched me up. And I was like yelling and screaming at him in the middle of the street. And I stopped myself because I was like, shit. I don't want someone to call the police on him because the police show up to a DV situation. I'm only but so big. You know, I like big dudes. I was like, the police show up. Only God knows what would happen. And he's drunk. And I was like, even though he snatched me up and my arm is going to be bruised by morning, I don't want him to be killed. Do you know I let that man in my house? I stayed downstairs. I let him go inside in case somebody called the police so he wouldn't be standing outside. And I sat in my car and waited for his friend to show up. I was a grown woman when I did that. So I get it. I get why Meg decided not to say anything, but I hope anybody who still does that, who still puts the protection of a black man above themselves, I hope they listen to Meg's story and they learn that she gained nothing by trying to protect Tory Lanez because all his people did was drag her and all other people did was make assumptions about her that were negative. She's the one that got shot. She is the victim and people calling her a damn snitch for talking about a man that shot her. That's crazy. We have some shenanigans to discuss this week. Folks been acting up. Some of God's children. Let's start with Tavis Smiley. This is a story of when audacity goes wrong. This happened about two weeks ago, but we've had um, the last couple, the last couple episodes of the podcast. We've had experts to talk about big issues. So this is one of the stories that we missed, but it's a crazy story. If you remember that back in 2017, Tavis Smiley was fired from PBS amid sexual misconduct allegations. This was the height of the Me Too movement. He sued PBS. He said that he was dropped from the network as a result of racial bias and he was wrongly terminated. He was the only solo black host on a PBS show. 
Now, at the time, he admitted that he had engaged in sexual relationships with employees, but he insisted that they were consensual. PBS's lawyer countered, and I echo her concerns. She said, quote, you can't have a consensual relationship between a manager and a subordinate because of the power dynamic. It's never consensual because that manager has power over all aspects of that person's employment. So Tavis Smiley sued PBS for a million dollars, but then the network countersued him. They said that Smiley had breached a morality clause in his contract. This all happens in the end of 2017, the beginning of 2018, and just a couple weeks ago, A Washington, D.C. jury found that Smiley did, in fact, violate the morals clause of his contract by carrying on a sexual relationship with multiple subordinates. The judge ruled that Smiley had to pay PBS $2.6 million. Tabby Smiley had no business suing PBS because he knew what he did and he knew that PBS knew what he did. But I think his ego got the best of him. So during this three-week trial, jurors heard from six women who testified that Smiley had subjected subordinates to unwanted, not consensual, unwanted sexual advances. One woman had accused Smiley of sexual harassment and left the show. She had already received a $325,000 payout from PBS. She testified at the trial that Smiley made numerous sexual advances toward her. And when she rebuffed him, he said, I'm tired of you telling me no. I'm tired of you rejecting me. I'm going to show you what happens to people when they reject me. That woman ended up leaving the job and filing a sexual harassment complaint, hence the $325,000. You knew that this woman had filed a sexual harassment complaint and you knew that PBS had settled it and you still filed suit against them for wrongful termination after you didn't get terminated after they had to settle a sexual harassment suit for you. That's that's some audacity, but we're not done. Another woman testified that she did, in fact, have a consensual relationship with Smiley. She said, though, that when she turned him down for sex, He reminded her that he was her boss. She said, quote, I felt like my job was in jeopardy and that if I didn't do what he wanted sexually, I would lose my job. That woman was later fired and she testified she believed it was because others in the office had learned of her relationship with Smiley. Another woman was a paid guest on Smiley's show. She said they had, quote, some intimate connections, whatever that means but that he refused to have her back on the show after she turned him down for sex. Three other women testified to Smiley's use of crude language at work, his anger, and his habit of yelling at subordinates. Sir, you knew you did all this shit, and you went and sued PBS for firing you? Like you knew they did an investigation into your background. You knew that you propositioned women for sex. You knew that you told women that if they didn't have sex with you, they weren't coming back on the show or that you would seek some sort of revenge. You knew that you did that shit. You knew that you showed up to that job and you acted like a ham dick crazed fool some days and you still sued PBS after PBS fired you and was going to let you walk and keep the money because they didn't want to deal with your headache. Now, almost three years after this drama has taken place, you should be trying to have a comeback season. You can't have no comeback season when we read in the salacious details of how you was up in the office acting. You can't be employed when this is how you behave at work, sir. Now, if you'd gone on and been quiet, you would have kept your $2.6 million. We wouldn't have known these salacious details. Other men who were fired during Me Too, they're trying to resurface now. You can't. Not with this story. You're going to have to sit out another three years. All because you sued them people when you knew that you were rightly fired. Sir, you were good at your job. Tyvis Smiley, I mean, I didn't agree with everything he said. He got a lot right. I give credit where it's due. But sir, out here telling women they can't come on the show unless they have sex with you. Are you serious right now? You don't know how to act in the workplace. You can't go work nowhere. Sir. Speaking of people not knowing how to act, 
because it's not just a black thing. We talk about ratchet and respectable. We don't apply that to color. We mean all people who are ratchet. Jerry Falwell Jr., he out here being ratchet. He and his wife, Becky, with an I. If you're not familiar with Jerry Falwell Jr., he is, a, he is an evangelical leader. The New York Post called him one of the most influential right-wing Christian leaders in the country. He's a prominent conservative. And he also recently resigned as the president of Liberty University after a series of personal scandals. No worries for him, though, because, you know, white people fail up. His contract with the university entitles him to a $10.5 million severance package. So he'll be all right. And if you're not familiar with Liberty University, you should know that they have, quote, an exacting honor code where sexual relationships outside of biblically ordained marriage between a natural born man and a natural born woman are not permissible. Jerry Falwell Jr. was not practicing what he preached before he resigned. He was actually suspended with pay earlier this month after he posted what has been called a provocative photo on social media. I'm reading this from the Washington Post, so they're not giving you the full details of what provocative means. But Jerry Falwell is a whole married man. He's been married since the late 80s. He's in his late 50s. He posted a picture on his Instagram page of he and a woman. They were standing next to each other. The woman has on jeans. Her pants are unbuttoned and her zipper is unzipped and her tummy is out. And Jerry is standing next to her. His pants are also unbuckled and unbuttoned and unzipped. But he posted this picture on his Instagram page and people were like, hey man, why are you posting pictures of you and this woman who is not your wife with your pants unbuttoned and unzipped? What you been up to, man? That don't look like, you know, the the head of a university where unmarried co-eds are forbidden from having sex. That don't really look like, you know, the behavior that they should be engaging in. So people were like, hey, man, why you got this picture on, on your Instagram? That's not that's not Christ like. And he was like, oh, because she's my wife's assistant and she's pregnant. So she couldn't button her pants. And I was like making fun of her with her. And so I unbuttoned my pants. And I'm like, so you one, you did this dumb shit Two, you allow somebody to take a picture of you doing this dumb shit as the president of a Christian university. And then three, you uploaded this dumb shit on your phone. So you want to tell me, were you drunk or were you high? Because that wasn't no sober man's thoughts. No one's that stupid. Share with the group, Jerry. Share with the group. But here a month later, we have a new scandal. A gentleman by the name of, let's find his name. A gentleman by the name of Giancarlo Granda. He met the Falwells back in 2012 at the Fontaine Blue in Miami. And Granda says that he carried on a six-year relationship with Mrs. Falwell, Becky with an I. Granda says that over the six-year relationship, he claimed he joined the Falwells multiple times per year at hotels in Miami and New York, as well as their home in Virginia. And he would have sex with Becky while, quote, Jerry enjoyed watching from the corner of the room. Hmm. Now, initially, Jerry Falwell said he had no knowledge of these accusations. He said he was being extorted. There was no truth. But then he told the Washington Post on Tuesday that while he had not been involved in an affair, his wife, Becky, with an I, had. And then Becky, in the same interview, confirmed that account. She went on to say that I wish Christians and people would be as forgiving as Christ was. She said that the relationship was humbling and embarrassing. You think? Now, Giancarlo, he was 20 when he met the Falwells. And he now says that Jerry Falwell was a predator. He recalled a time that Falwell had sent him an image of a female Liberty University student exposing herself at the Falwells farm. Now, Falwell was asked about this accusation and he said he didn't deny it happened. He gave a very interesting story. Falwell said that Granda may have been referring to an incident where he and his wife were out of town. His daughters-in-law and a friend were using the family's guest house to cook a meal. I'm reading this from the Washington Post, by the way. Falwell said the friend pulled up her skirt as a joke while she was cooking. The daughter-in-laws were videotaping the girl and sent screenshots around. 
Falwell said she had on, I don't know how to say this, granny panties. Falwell also said that he sent the screenshot to several people because he thought it was funny. Sir, you are a whole married man and you're out here sending pictures of a, of a co-ed in her underwear to other people because you thought it was funny? That sounds right to you? That sounds appropriate? That sounds like a good Christian, a good evangelical Christian? You, that sounds like something they should be doing? The head of a Christian university, that sounds like good behavior to you, sir? I don't know. I hang out with heathens. My heathen friends don't do shit like that. Now, we done had a lot of good times. We done had a lot of liquor. We might have had some other substances, too. I can't recall nobody at the cookout just pulling up their skirt for no reason. I know plenty of heathens. I ain't never seen that behavior before. It seems if you really want to have a wild time, you need to go hang out with some evangelical Christians because they be getting it in, apparently. This is, but yeah, this is the Falwell story. Washington Post points out that these current accusations from Granda have revived attention to a claim that Michael Cohen, Trump's former personal attorney and fixer, Cohen said he'd intervene for Falwell a few years ago when someone was threatening to blackmail him with embarrassing images. Now, Falwell did confirm to the Post on Tuesday that Cohen had helped him. He said they were pictures of his wife and they weren't fully nude. And he said he was proud of how she looked. He said someone had got a hold of his phone and stolen the photos of he, of he and his wife in their backyard and were threatening to release them to the media. Child, these people are in their 50s. I'm like, all the life y'all live, y'all can't calm down just yet? Y'all still want to be just out here, out in the world, evangelicals, Christians, out in the world. Look, I've been a heathen a really long time. I don't have these kind of scandals. Naked in the backyard, folks at cookouts pulling up their skirt. Mm -mm, these are not the heathen stories I have to tell. Getting caught with women who ain't your wife, with your pants unbuckled and your zipper unzipped, posting this foolishness on the internet. Mm -mm. My heathen friends know how to keep their shit on the low. They might do a little something strange, a little something extra. They got enough good sense not to put it on the goddamn internet. Somebody might be able to tell a story about it, but pictures, no pictures, no video, it didn't happen. You got plausible deniability. Unlike sir, apparently he and his wife like to document everything. I'm going to just hang out with heathens. These evangelical Christians be doing the most. That's too much for me. Having folks watching while you're fucking, that's, you know, I don't knock it. That's not my thing. But you know, if it's yours, God bless. But that's a lot. That's many things, many, many things. Choosing an at-home workout can be overwhelming, but Beachbody wants to take all the anxiety out of a workout and let you enjoy a fun, simple, and affordable way to get your body moving. Get access to professional training from the comfort of your own home with Beachbody On Demand. Now, we've talked about Beachbody many times. I started with Sean T, and then I switched over to Amale Caesar. If you follow me on Instagram, you know what Snack Ministry is. Amale Caesar is that. And he has really good workouts. Beachbody On Demand is the company behind P90X, Insanity, and 21 Day Fix. Now, check out some of Beachbody's newest programs like Muscle Burns Fat and 80 Day Obsession. Beachbody On Demand is the best deal in fitness. And listeners of Ratchet and Respectable can try it absolutely free. Now, I've been doing the work with Amole Caesar. Log on to Beachbody On Demand, click on Amole Caesar, and you will immediately understand why I am obsessed with Beachbody On Demand. I want you to join me on Beachbody On Demand. Summer's almost over, but I want us to stay summertime sexy year round. To get a special free trial membership, text Ratchet to 303030. You'll get full access to the entire platform. All the workouts, nutrition information, and support absolutely free. Just text RATCHET to 303030. Is there something interfering with your happiness? Anything keeping you from achieving your goals? I know what that feeling is. I've had my own bouts with unhappiness and depression. And if you are experiencing it, know that you don't have to go through it alone. If you are looking for help, BetterHelp is here to, well, help. BetterHelp's mission is to make professional counseling accessible, affordable, and convenient. So anyone who struggles with life's challenges can get help anytime, 
anywhere. BetterHelp will assess your needs and match you with your own licensed professional therapist. It's not self-help, it's professional counseling. BetterHelp is committed to facilitating great therapeutic matches. It's more affordable than traditional offline counseling and financial aid is available. So many people have been using BetterHelp that they are recruiting additional counselors in all 50 states. If your life is not what you want it to be, if you are in conflict and chaos, it is time to get help. BetterHelp can help. I want you to start living a happier life today. As a listener, you'll get 10% off your first month by visiting betterhelp.com slash ratchet. Join over 1 million people taking charge of their mental health. Again, that's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash ratchet we have more things to discuss we're gonna talk about john gray our favorite minister that said with much sarcasm much much sarcasm i didn't know him when he had the show on own john gray didn't pop up on my radar i was backstage doing an activation for essence fest one year and john gray interviewed snoop and everybody made a big deal when he walked in but i didn't know who he was Somebody had to tell me. And I was like, oh, okay. And they were like, oh, he has a show on OWN. And I was like, mm, oh, oh, okay. But then he did this interview. I want to say it was with Sister Circle. And he was talking about he's caused his wife more pain than the children. And then he talked about how his wife was a coat that was like three sizes too big. And I was like, well, that's great for you because that means your wife covers you. But that means you also don't fit with your wife. You're, you're a big man. But you're telling me that your wife is a gallon-sized woman and you can't really fill her. It works for you because you get more than you need. But what does it do for your wife who isn't getting enough? And this is by you putting this out there. That's not me reading into it. That's shit you said. That was my introduction to him. Needless to say, I wasn't very impressed. Shortly after that, he had a scandal where he was accused of being in an extramarital relationship. He and his wife passed it off as an emotional situation. He said that things weren't going very well in the marriage and he had reached out to a woman and he was having conversations that he should have been having with his wife. But that story was all over the news. It was very embarrassing. And shortly after that, he bought his wife a Lamborghini truck, which he said was for their anniversary. But everybody else read is like, oh, that's a please don't leave me gift. Please don't break up my family. That was sometime last year. I want to say early last year. Maybe two years ago. John Gray is again in the news for the same shit. Tasha Kay. I I can't call her a gossip blogger. I I call her a a woman who shared facts with receipts. She posted a series of videos that were given to her by a woman named Mary who said that she had a, a something with John Gray. Now, John Gray's attorneys told the Greenville News on Monday that the allegations about this extramarital affair are based solely on phone calls and not physical contact. These are the attorneys for the church and Gray. They said there are allegations that there were phone conversations between the two parties. No affair, no physical contact. They never met each other. They never saw each other. Hmm. The attorneys for the megachurch continue and they say there was no evidence of an inappropriate relationship. I think they may have seen different videos than the ones I saw, or perhaps they may have a different definition of inappropriate. Again, I hang out with heathens. I'm a Christian woman and I have Christian friends, but I usually spend most of my time with my heathens. Apparently I've been missing out because some of the Christians are just reckless. But like I said, Tasha Kay had a series of videos from a woman named Mary. She said she met John Gray at a funeral for her brother's wife where Gray delivered the eulogy. And she says from there that Gray continued to pursue her. I'm going to tell you about some of the videos that Mary shared with Tasha Kay and then Tasha Kay shared with the rest of the world. In one of the videos, John Gray, a whole married man, visibly seen on camera. He's in the car. He got his baby in the back seat. He's on FaceTime with Mary and he's complaining to Mary that his wife doesn't cook. He's got his little boy in the back seat and he said, what do you eat every night for dinner? And the little boy said, pizza. I'm going to repeat what I said. Sir is in the car with his young son and is on FaceTime with his mistress 
complaining about that child's mama and enlisting his child to back up his complaints about his mother to his father's mistress. Nigga, that's how mansions go whoosh. That type of shit, that's how dudes end up with their cars set on fire or get run over. Not just because you cheated, the level of disrespect with which you did cheat. You sitting in the car with your baby on the phone with your mistress. And your lawyer's talking about no evidence of an inappropriate relationship. Tell me, please, how do y'all define inappropriate? Because that shit sounds really inappropriate to me. There's more. John Gray, a whole and entire married man, is on FaceTime again, inviting a woman who is not his wife to hop on a private jet and go to Mexico with him. Just to be clear, these are recent conversations because he has on a mask in the video. Because it's a global pandemic. That started in March. So sometime between March and now, he was inviting a woman, Mary, who is not his wife, to go on vacation with him. What y'all going to do on this vacation in Mexico? Y'all going to pray together? Again, the attorneys for the megachurch told the Greenville News that there is no evidence of an inappropriate relationship. Please, please, how do y'all define inappropriate if this ain't it? There's more. A whole and entire married man is on video talking about how he want to cook for this woman. Sir said he wanted to make some brisket. He wanted to make some baked beans with the hamburger meat. He was willing to make more sides. He said, tell me whatever you want. Tell me whatever you want to eat. That's what he was trying to do for Mary. You really trying to tell me this man is trying to get this woman to go on a private jet with him. Is in the car with his baby in the backseat complaining about that child's mother to his mistress. Is trying to make this woman a whole personal barbecue. But he ain't seen or experienced none of the whap? Really? As one of my good Facebook friends said, she was like, girl, Mary must have made him weep and moan. Because he doing the most. There's still more. There's more. Mary shared with Tasha K. She shared a screenshot of the minister. The married minister. The pastor. He sent her $200 Apple Pay. Trying to get her to send him a picture of her titties. Grown ass man at the big age of 47 or 48 is trying to pay a woman $200 to see some titties. I feel like people are selling full fucks for $200. $200 just for a glimpse of titty? That's a lot for some titties. That's a lot. And Mary did not comply, at least not in the screenshots that she showed. Oh, there's more. What else did Mary say? Mary said that she sent Pastor Gray partially nude photos at his request. He video chatted with her while revealing his underwear. She also claims that he invited her to visit his home where he lives with his wife and children while his wife was out of town. I try to burn that whole bitch down with him in it. I claim temporary insanity afterward. You really tried to have a mistress up in your marital home. Really? That's a lot. That's much. Like I said, I think I've been hanging with heathens too long. Heathens at least got a code. Like, sir is out here doing the absolute most. Involving the baby in the situation. I know heathens. Heathens don't do that. That's. We do dirt, but we leave Jesus out of it. We leave Instagram out of it, too. I just. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't know what this man is thinking. How many quote unquote emotional affairs are you going to have on this woman? How many? And you need to stop because you're bad at it. Every time you do it, you get caught. Sir. Just out here embarrassing himself and doing that crazy shit in Jesus' name. Look, I hang with heathens. I am a heathen from time to time. Like, I'm Christian as well, but I got a lot of heathen habits that I'm working on, you know? But sir, do you want to be out here with strange women, random whap? That's the life that you're about? You can live that life. You just need to get a divorce. You need to step down from the church. You need to go be a private citizen and be like, I'm going to be the person that I feel like I was meant to be. Because you out here doing the things that you like to do and they don't align with your marriage. They don't align with you being a pastor of the church. Like there's certain things that as a husband, that as a pastor of a church, there's certain parameters that you should be placing on your behavior that clearly you don't want to place because you've done this multiple times now. I get it. Everybody can't walk in the image of Christ and that's okay. But if you're not trying to be a faithful husband and you want to be out here with these different women, then you need to just be a single man. You need to step down from the pulpit and do all your hoeing in peace. People can't say nothing to single people who out here living a life. 
I wish somebody would say something to me about the way I use my personal parts. I use my parts how I see fit. I am single and I am grown. You could be that too. But you can't be married and do that. You can't be a pastor and do that. I mean, you can because you're doing it. But you look crazy. You look crazy. And this wife, your wife, I feel for your wife. I do. Because last time you did this shit, your wife came out going to bat for you. People remember that? When she was fussing and carrying on on the internet, going off on Derek Jackson? She got up in, I don't know if it was a church, and she was talking about some strange woman had encountered her husband and she had to fight the woman off with prayer and scripture. This is what she said. She said, quote, I know the tricks of the enemy and I'm learning them every day. I can stand here in boldness for everybody that tried to sneak in. Thank you because I got closer to God because of it. I got in that word. Come on. I put scripture on that strange woman. I put scripture on that strange woman. She don't want it with me and she don't want it with y'all. Amen. Ma'am, what are you saying? She said that strange woman wasn't speaking to her grown husband, but she was speaking to the 16-year-old inside him that couldn't get a date, and he listened. She said the woman spoke to her husband in a place of brokenness. She went on to say something. I don't have this in my notes, but do y'all recall something about her saying that a rib meant rest in brokenness? It was some justification for why she was going to support her husband through these public shenanigans. Like, girl, okay. I don't know no scripture that says rest in brokenness. If you know it, can you send it to me? I'm like, look, lady, I ain't got nothing against this lady. Sometimes she got a very sour disposition. But if my husband was out here acting a perpetual fool, I get it. You got a lot going on. You're dealing with a lot. I get it. If you're going to stay with this man and that's your choice. But if you're going to stay, you got to stop being out here trying to defend his crazy shit. Because the woman you calling strange, she was very familiar to your husband. Your husband was calling her. But you out here trying to be like, oh, she wasn't talking to him. She was talking to the 16-year-old boy inside him. Well, look, there's a 16-year-old inside all of us. As a grown-ass person, you're supposed to ignore that impulsive person. There's an 18-year-old girl that lives inside me and just be like, blow the rent on a Louis Vuitton bag. Blow the rent on going back to Istanbul. I know you don't have Ben's truck money, but you should lease a Ben's truck. The 41-year-old inside of me says, well, you know what? I need to get my paper up. Before I do some dumb shit, I need to pay my rent instead of buying bags. That's what adults do. You don't give in to the impulses of your teenage self to try to get your husband off the hook and be like, oh, it was his 16 year old self and it wasn't his grown self and husband, father self. No, it was all the same damn person doing dumb shit. In order to justify staying in crazy situations, sometimes you got to make up shit that makes it okay for you to be there. And that's okay. You just can't get in public and start telling people that because you sound crazy. If you want to stay, stay. Look, wives get cheated on every day, B. Some leave, some don't. Personal decision. Do what you got to do. But if you stay with this man and this man insists on continuing his foolishness, don't you stand up there and look foolish with him. You let him stand right up there and look crazy by himself. He did that shit. You didn't do it. Ma'am is well educated. She's got a couple degrees. One of them is in science, cardio, cardiovascular, cardio, I wrote it down, cardiopulmonary, cardiopulmonary science. Woman is no slouch. And this, by the way, that she goes off on people on Instagram, I've long believed that she's the brains behind this operation of her and her husband. I've noticed lately that she's been building a personal brand. I think I read that she had a podcast. I follow her stylist on Instagram, really nice guy. But she's lost a bunch of weight recently. She's looking real good. Now, ma'am, again, is grown. Ma'am can make her decisions. Ma'am can do what ma'am feels best for her. But I hope that ma'am knows her worth. When I say don't waste your pretty, that's what I mean. Don't give up all your good stuff, WAP included. Don't waste it on somebody who's not showing reciprocity. Don't waste it on somebody who doesn't show appreciation. Don't waste it on somebody who's just using you up and draining you dry. Now, if this ma'am or any other ma'am wants to make the choice... The choice to stay in a a foolish situation, well, that's a choice. You don't have to do that. If you think you can do better, if you want better, you can go get better. And that's not me telling people to go run off and get divorces. You ever want to talk to people who don't believe in divorce? Talk to people who've been divorced. Tell you what a bitch it is. Avoid it at all costs if you possibly can. That said, don't sit up in no crazy thinking you ain't got no choice but to stay there. You do. You do. You do. Beyonce said, 
She and them kids can go off and have a good life. They gonna be all right. I'm just saying. I hate to see women being dogged out like this man is doing his wife. It's just not right. Nobody deserves that. So that is our episode for this week. Oh, one more thing. I'm just checking my phone. I just got a text from a friend that said the Los Angeles Lakers and the Los Angeles Clippers have voted to boycott the rest of the season. So no justice, no peace, but also no justice, no games. So good for them trying to go on as business as usual when black folks are being slaughtered. Not okay. I support the athletes who are not taking this shit. I hate that it had to come to this, but here we are. Here we are. Stop shooting black people. You can have your lives back. Stop shooting black people. Thank you for listening to Ratchet and Respectable. If you enjoyed what you heard today, please subscribe to the podcast so you can get updates. If you need some Ratchet and Respectable in your life before next week's episode, please follow me on social media at Demetria L. Lucas. That's on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. And you can also follow me on my website, DemetriaLLucas.com. I mentioned this at the top of the podcast. I recently sold signed copies of my book. I've shut down the ordering for right now. But once I get a handle on this current situation, I will open it back up for people who would like to buy signed copies of Don't Waste Your Pretty. I also saw some people were asking for signed copies of A Bell in Brooklyn. Like I said, I went with a publisher for that book. I have to go through them to get author copies of the book. And I don't even remember how to do that. That book came out in 2011. So I have to call around over at Simon & Schuster and see how to get access to what's in the warehouse. So that is everything for this week. Thank you again for listening. And we will talk next Thursday. Okay, bye. Choosing an at-home workout can be overwhelming, but Beachbody wants to take all the anxiety out of a workout and let you enjoy a fun, simple, and affordable way to get your body moving. Get access to professional training from the comfort of your own home with Beachbody On Demand. Now, we've talked about Beachbody many times. I started with Sean T, and then I switched over to Amale Caesar. If you follow me on Instagram, you know what Snack Ministry is. Amale Caesar is that. And he has really good workouts. Beachbody On Demand is the company behind P90X, Insanity, and 21 Day Fix. Now, check out some of Beachbody's newest programs like Muscle Burns Fat and 80 Day Obsession. Beachbody On Demand is the best deal in fitness. And listeners of Ratchet and Respectable can try it absolutely free. Now, I've been doing the work with Amole Caesar. Log on to Beachbody On Demand, click on Amole Caesar, and you will immediately understand why I am obsessed with Beachbody On Demand. I want you to join me on Beachbody On Demand. Summer's almost over, but I want us to stay summertime sexy year round. To get a special free trial membership, text RATCHET to 303030. You'll get full access to the entire platform. All the workouts, nutrition information, and support absolutely free. Just text RATCHET to 303030.